Welcome, everyone. My name is Joyce Brocky, and I'm the director of the Voices of Experience from the Iowa City Senior Center in collaboration with the poetry group Reading Aloud under the direction of Ina Lowenberg, also from the Iowa City Senior Center. Today we are going to be co commemorating the beginning of World War I in a program of poems, a short lecture, and songs. And to begin this presentation, guest performer Roscoe Porch, a member of the Iowa City Senior Center's New Horizons Band, will play Reveille, followed by the song Over There. And over there was a popular song composed by George M. Cohen with the intent to urge young American men to enlist in the Army to fight for inva invasion. And I'd like you to hold your applause throughout this program until the end of the, uh, end of the program. Thank you. I'm Ina Lowenberg, and now we're going into the poetry part of the program read by the Reading Aloud group. Uh, we're so pleased to be collaborating with Voices of Experience and having a talk by Lauren Horton. Um, it's a wonderful way to do things all together. But you may noticed, notice that we are dressed in black. This is our standard performing uh, outfit. The singers are dressed mostly in some combination of red, white, and blue. And um, this 
in a way symbolizes the contrast between the parts of the program. You will notice that the poems we read, most of them, are rather dark, are rather grim. They are about the reality of war. The songs that Voices of Experience sing are more upbeat and patriotic. And this is not, um, this is not a contrast that shouldn't be there. This is part of what our life experience is. There's war, there's patriotism, and hopefully there is at least sometimes peace. So now we will begin. On being asked for a war poem by William Butler Yeats. I think it better that in times like these a poet's mouth be silent, for in truth we have no gift to set a statesman right. He has had enough of meddling who can please a young girl in the indolence of her youth or an old man upon a winter's night. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's, breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think this heart all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy <clears throat> as her day, and laughter learnt of friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. The Lost Army by Marjorie Lawrence. Written after news of 250 men and 16 officers lost in a battle in 1916. Singing and shouting, they swept to the treacherous forest. Darkness and silence received them and smothered their pain. Darkness and silence and night is the end of their story. They came not again. Never a hero came forth of the legions that enter. Never a cry, nor a prayer, nor a song of the brave. Dark and in silence, the sinister forest received them and make them a grave. Somewhere deep down in the heart of the wood that betrayed them, shoulder to shoulder they lied with their wounds to the floor. There in the dark and the silence they sleep the lost army returning no more. We may not hear of the valor, the death, or the glory. Nay, they were ours, and they died for their country. And so, darkness and silence and night is the end of their story. All we need no. Next to, of course, God by E. E. Cummings. 
Next to, of course, God, America. I love you, land of the pilgrims, and so forth. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early, <clears throat> excuse me, my country tis of centuries come and go and are no more. What of it? We should worry in every language, even deaf and dumb. Thy sons acclaim your glorious name by gory, by jingle, by gee, by gosh, by gum. Why talk of beauty? What could be more beautiful than these heroic happy dead who rushed like lions to the roaring slaughter? They did not stop to think. They died instead. Then shall the voice of liberty be mute? He spoke and drank rapidly a glass of water. Dulce est decorum est by Wilfred Owen. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs. And towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on. Bloodshot. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sun, sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gurgling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. The Parable of the Old Man and the Young by Wilfred Owen. So Abram rose and clave the wood and went and took the fire with him and a knife. And as they sojourned both of them together, Isaac the firstborn spake and said, My father, behold the preparations, fire and iron, but where the lamb for this burnt offering? Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps and builded parapets and trenches there and stretched forth the knife to slay his son. When lo, an angel called him out of heaven, saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him thy son. Behold, caught in a thicket by its horns a ram, Offer the ram of pride instead. But the old man would not so, but slew his son and half the seed of Europe one by one.
Break of Day in the Trenches by Isaac Rosenberg. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat. As I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Droll rat, they would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. Now you have touched this English hand. You will do the same to a German soon, no doubt, if it be your pleasure to cross the sleeping green between. It seems you inwardly grin as you pass strong eyes, fine limbs, haughty athletes, less chanced than you for life. Bonds to the whims of murder sprawled in the bowels of the earth, the torn fields of France. What do you see in our eyes? At the shrieking iron and flame hurled through the still heavens, what quaver, what heart aghast. Poppies whose roots are in man's veins drop and are ever dropping, but mine is safe behind my ear, just a little white with the dust. An Irish Airman Foresees His Death by William Butler Yeats. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen Kiltartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. Nor law nor duty bade me fight, nor public men, nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed a waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind in balance with this life, this death. Dreamers by Siegfried Sassoon. Soldiers are citizens of death's gray land, drawing no dividend from time's tomorrows. In each great hour of destiny they stand, each with his feuds and jealousies and sorrows. Soldiers are sworn to action. They must win some flaming fatal climax with their lives. Soldiers are dreamers. When the guns begin, they think of firelit homes, clean beds, and wives. I see them in foul dugouts gnawed by rats, and in the ruined trenches lashed with rain, dreaming of things they did with balls and bats, and mocked by hopeless longings to regain bank holidays and picture shows and spats and going to the office in the train. <laughs> the 
The Dancers by Edith Sitwell, written during a great battle, 1916. The floors are slippery with blood. The world gyrates too. God is good that while his wind blows out the light for those who hourly die for us, we still can dance each night. The music has grown numb with death, but we will suck their dying breath, the whispered name they breathe to chance to swell our music, make it loud that we may dance, may dance. We are the dull, blind, carrion fly that dance and batten. Though God die mad from the horror of the light, the light is mad too, flecked with blood. We dance, we dance each night. In Flanders Fields by John McCrae. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunrise glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. Nineteen thirty five by Stephen Vincent Benet. All night they marched, the infantrymen under pack, but the hands gripping the rifles were naked bone, and the hollow pits of the eyes stared vacant and black when the moonlight shone. The gas mask lay like a blot on the empty chest. The slanting helmets were spattered with rust and mold, but they burrowed the hill for the machine gun nest as they had of old. And the guns rolled and the tanks, but there was no sound, never the gasp or rustle of living men. Where the skeletons strung their wire on disputed ground, I knew them then. It is 17 years, I cried. You must come no more. We know your names. We know that you are the dead. Must you march forever from France and the last blind war? Fool, from the next, they said. I'm Lauren Horton, and it's my uh, job to talk about the causes of World War I, and we should separate the causes of World War I from the incident that touched off the war. I titled my lecture, Europe on the Edge of Catastrophe, because those four years from 1914 to 1918 were, uh, by any stretch of anybody's imagination, a catastrophe, uh, particularly in the death toll, which exceeded 40 million direct uh, causes from the war, and also the impact 
of what was in those days called shell shock after the war from those who were in combat. You probably know that the incident that actually touched off the war was the assassination of the heir to the Habsburg throne in Sarajevo in June of 1918 by a young man named Gavrilo Princip, who was a member of a group called the Black Hand. And they were trying to get independence of Bosnia from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, that incident led the Habsburg monarchy, which ruled the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to send an ultimatum to Serbia, whom they blamed for that event. And Serbia uh, rejected the ultimatum, and on the 28th of July, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. And from then on, it was like dominoes falling in rows, uh, countries uh, declaring war on each other, mobilizing, and the war started. But there are at least six underlying causes to that war, and that's what I really want to talk about. These are not in necessary, necessarily order of importance, but uh, they all fit together and they all are underlying causes why such an incident, the assassination of an heir to the throne in a very small part of the Balkans should have touched off a worldwide war. The first of the six is the growth during the previous century or so of nationalism and uh, a sense of patriotism to a country, which was a new concept in Europe. Before that time, there had been loyalty to the church, there had been loyalty to a ruler, there had been loyalty to uh, various uh, things, but not to the concept of a nation state. But that grew very rapidly started before the Napoleonic Wars and after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, it grew very, very rapidly and was very virulent by 1914. If you add that concept of nationalism and patriotism to these other five causes, you just see building blocks to where it almost seems like war was inevitable, although I'm not sure war is ever inevitable, but it seemed to be. A second cause was the absolutely almost indecipherable interrelationships of European royal families. Most of the countries in Europe, other than France, were at this time uh, ruled, were monarchies, constitutional monarchies to be sure, but they were nonetheless uh, ruled in one sense or another by royal families. Well, there were no countries in Europe that had royal families that were not related to all of the other countries in Europe that had royal families. Uh, now, I'm sure in your family, everybody gets along beautifully, <laughs> but that was not true in the case of the royal families of Europe. Uh, Queen Victoria, of England, of United Kingdom, uh, was called the grandmother of Europe for a very good reason. Uh, she had nine, she and her husband Albert had nine children, and in arranging the marriages of those children, because they had to marry other royalty, uh, they were scattered around so that uh, Queen Victoria's family, which was actually the Coburg family, it wasn't Windsor yet until 1916, were the reigning monarchs in Russia, in Germany, in England, in Portugal, in Bulgaria, and in Romania. And they were the uh, heirs, uh, or uh, they were married to the monarchs in a number of other countries. Now, this can have a good result or this can have a bad result. The bad result in this case was the fact that Queen Victoria died in 1901 
And her son, eldest son, Edward VII, succeeded her. And he uh, did not get along with his nephew, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. And that is one of the underlying causes of World War I. The not getting along, but the jealousy between them, which led to some other ramifications. One of Queen Victoria's uh, granddaughters was married to the Tsar of Russia. And uh, that's about a 50 minute lecture, so we won't go into that today. But uh, that relationship and that woman who married the Tsar of Russia was a major factor in, in causing World War I. We don't need to go into the other royal families, but uh, those, those are really probably the best examples of that. A third cause was the fact that uh, there was a, 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 just a drastically escalating arms race, a manufacturing of munitions and of naval ships, warships, uh, beginning particularly in 1906, but it had been going on for some time before that. Now, if you go to all the expense of producing armaments and warships, there is unfortunately a tendency to then use them. And the naval race between Germany and England or the United Kingdom was uh, certainly uh, and is always given as one of the causes of World War I. Who's going to have more ships? Who's going to have bigger ships? who's going to have more dreadnoughts than the other, who's going to have more battleships, and who's going to control the ports, and so on and so forth. Once you have the armaments, and it was particularly between England and Germany that they were arming, but France and Russia were doing it too, uh, then there's the, the danger that you'll think, if we spend all this money and all this time preparing all of this war equipment, then we're going to use it. Uh, the fourth general cause was the fact that beginning in uh, the 15th century, countries of Europe began to acquire colonies throughout the world. And it became a kind of a game with these countries. Uh, who's going to have the most colonies and who's going to have the most productive colonies as far as returning goods back to the mother country and so on. Well, Germany was not united until 1870, 1871, and Italy was not united until as to, to be a country until 1864. And so they got into the game very late. That's 19th century, and the, the race for colonies had begun in the 15th century. So who had colonies? Spain had colonies, Portugal had colonies, England had colonies, France had colonies, the Dutch had colonies, the Belgians had colonies. Everybody had colonies, and Germany and Italy wanted colonies, and so there became a lot of friction over who was going to get what. And they were partitioning Asia, and they were partitioning Africa. North and South America were not involved because they'd already been partitioned uh, uh, centuries before that. It was a particularly hot issue, again, between Germany and England in Africa over who was going to get what. And England had the most, and England had the most productive colonies, and Germany was chafing under this, that they had to take the leftovers that were less productive and less desirable. Rivalries over colonial empires are a definite uh, cause. A third, I'm sorry, a fifth one is entangling alliances. Now, countries often sign treaties with one another, and in this case, there were two major groups. There was a group called the Triple Alliance, which consisted of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Italy. It was called the Triple Alliance. Actually, I hope there's nobody of Italian derivation in the audience because although Italy was a member of the Triple Alliance allied with Germany 
and with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When the war broke out, they actually came into the war on the other side. However, the Ottoman Empire, which we know as Turkey, came in on the side, so there were still three countries on that side. The other uh, group was called the Triple Entente, and it consisted of England, and I'm using England to indicate the United Kingdom always, uh, France and Russia. However, uh, curiously enough, during World War I, Japan came in on the side of the Triple Entente, even though eight years before, Russia and Japan had fought a major war. Uh, it's all very curious how these things uh, happen. But at any rate, the treaties said that if country A is threatened by country G, country B will come to the aid of country A, and country H will come to the aid of country G. Well, the ultimatum by the Austro-Hungarian Empire to Serbia meant that Russia was bound to come in on the side of Serbia. Germany was bound to come in on the side of Austria-Hungary. So once that ultimatum was rejected and the war was declared, they just all started declaring war on each other because of these entangling alliances. And finally, uh, the sixth major cause, underlying cause, was uh, business, commerce, and trade uh, ambitions. Everybody wanted to be more prosperous than everybody else. In order to do that, you sometimes have to, you know, to be a success, there are some people who think you have to step on other people to uh, rise yourself. Well, most of these European countries thought they had to step on somebody else to prevent somebody else from becoming prosperous so they would become prosperous. The three major examples of that are that England wanted to build a railroad from Cape Town to Cairo, the entire length of Africa. And they were thwarted in that because one of the leftover pieces of Africa that the Germans got as a colony was in the way of the route. Okay, more friction between Germany and England here. Germany wanted to build a railroad uh, from Berlin to Baghdad, but the English and the Russians control some land that keep them from doing that, so there's friction there. And then finally, there's the Suez Canal. If you're going to have a lot of trade with Eastern Asia, the Eastern part of Asia, you're going to have to use the Suez Canal. The English controlled the Suez Canal and the Germans didn't like that. So rivalries over all of these things that I've mentioned led to the treaties, which led to the entangling alliances, which led to the domino effect once one thing happened. And my lecture was titled, Europe on the Edge of Catastrophe, because as I said at the beginning, if you have more than 40 million people killed as a direct result of the war, I consider that a catastrophe. And World War I broke out then, 28th of July, 1914. And the armistice was signed November the 11th, 1918. And that's why we're here on November the 11th, to celebrate that armistice.
this time I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Jerry Pearson, who's a retired physical chemist, will be playing uh, melodic descant on the alto recorder as an additional accompaniment to the piece, World Peace Canon. <laughs> 